hydrogen power. From the sun and throughout the universe, it's the most plentiful element known to humanity. And we're just beginning to harness its power through fuel cells, clean energy for the future. I'm Ira Flato, host of NPR Science Friday, and I'm here today to share with you what we know about fuel cells. But first, just imagine for a moment an energy source that could literally prevent millions of tons of emissions from polluting our air, while significantly reducing our dependence on imported oil. A supply of power so clean, so quiet, so safe, that it could be located right in the middle of populated cities or even in your own backyard. A device with no moving parts that could power everything from an electric utility to a motor scooter. It might sound like fantasy, but it's not. It's a future just around the corner, and it's called the fuel cell. Sir William Grove, this Welsh scientist built the first fuel cell in 1839 but it wasn't until 1950 that another British scientist, Francis Bacon, demonstrated its practical use in a fuel cell stack. Only then did the fuel cell begin to take off with the U.S. manned space program building on Bacon's success. Let's see how it works. Like a battery, a fuel cell has electrodes, an electrolyte, and produces electricity. Unlike a battery, a fuel cell doesn't store energy. It produces power as long as hydrogen and oxygen are supplied. Refueling, not recharging, is needed. This is what happens. Hydrogen fuel is fed to the anode. Upon contact, electrons are free, beginning the flow of electricity. The hydrogen ions then travel across the electrolyte to the cathode, where they recombine with freed electrons and with oxygen, forming electricity. Water and heat are released as byproducts. In certain types of fuel cells, other ions travel from cathode to anode instead of anode to cathode. But nevertheless, the premise remains the same, that electricity is generated through an electrochemical reaction. By combining hydrogen and oxygen to form water, you also create electricity with no combustion whatsoever. And this is what makes it so clean. In addition to high efficiencies and low emissions, one of the most attractive features of fuel cells is their modularity. Fuel cell stacks consist of individual cells, which are repeated until the desired power output is reached. To change the output, you just increase or decrease the number of cells. In a typical fuel cell, a rib bipolar separator plate acts as a gas manifold, provides the electrical connection between the cells, and creates a gas barrier, keeping the fuel and air streams in their respective compartments. There are five major types of fuel cells, each using different electrolytes and operating at different temperatures. Each is well suited for specific markets. Today we'll talk about the following fuel cells. Alkaline, phosphoric acid, proton exchange membrane, solid oxide, and the molten carbonate fuel cell. The most successful application of alkaline fuel cells has been in the U.S. space program, providing electricity and drinking water to all manned space missions since Apollo in the late 60s. The alkaline fuel cell uses only pure hydrogen and pure oxygen because of its sensitivity to carbon dioxide contamination. Its electrolyte consists of a highly conductive potassium hydroxide. The electrodes consist of crystallite structures with gold-plated nickel mesh conductors. Current research is focusing on terrestrial applications, including lower cost components, operation in near ambient temperature and pressure, and using simple air as the oxidant. 
Other fuel cells don't require pure hydrogen, but can use hydrogen-rich fuels, such as methanol or natural gas. But first, the fuel must be processed. One method is called the steam reforming process. Here's how it works. First, unused hydrogen from the fuel cell is mixed with air and burned to heat the catalyst. Fuel and water are then vaporized using the fuel cell's byproduct heat. The mixture flows through the catalyst bed, which accelerates the chemical reaction, producing carbon dioxide and hydrogen. The phosphoric acid fuel cell is the most commercially developed. It can operate on a variety of reformed hydrocarbon fuels and uses ambient air to provide the oxygen. It's already being used to generate power for hospitals, hotels, and office buildings, among others. And its application goes beyond stationary power generation. Recently, a phosphoric acid fuel cell bus was built by the U.S. Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and California's South Coast Air Quality Management District. A next generation 40-foot fuel cell bus is currently under development by the U.S. Department of Transportation and is being considered for use in a large fleet. Here's what's so exciting about fuel cells and transportation. Compared with diesels, the bus produces only half the greenhouse gases, 250 times fewer carbon monoxides, practically no nitrogen oxides, and zero particulates. As with all fuel cells, the lack of moving parts will significantly reduce maintenance. This kind of clean fuel cell driven vehicle is ideally suited for urban transit operation. And there are a number of other fuel cell vehicles being built today by various manufacturers that are also undergoing road tests. Phosphoric acid fuel cells operate at more than 40% efficiency and nearly 85% if the heat byproduct is used for cogeneration. This fuel cell operates effectively at ambient pressure and at moderately low temperatures near 400 degrees Fahrenheit. The future of fuel cells in transportation is well worth watching. The proton exchange membrane fuel cell, or PEM, has been demonstrated in buses and vans and is the prime candidate for passenger car applications. It currently holds the greatest promise for reaching the 80 miles per gallon goal set by the government industry partnership for a new generation of vehicles. And it's expected to do this while far exceeding clean air requirements. The world's automakers, including the U.S. Big Three, are actively pursuing its development. The PEM's low operating temperatures, about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and high power density make it quite suitable for automobiles where quick startup is required. As with the phosphoric acid fuel cell, the PEM can use hydrogen-rich gas from reformed fuels, but first, most of the carbon monoxide must be removed its most efficient operation occurs at higher pressures. Development is continuing to help broaden its efficient operation under a variety of conditions. The proton exchange membrane fuel cell differs from others in that it uses a solid proton conducting electrolyte, not unlike household plastic wrap. See, this immobile rather than liquid electrolyte simplifies sealing in the production process, reduces corrosion, and is expected to extend cell life. Studies have concluded that these qualities give the PEM fuel cell system the potential to be comparable in cost to current internal combustion engines. Both solid oxide and molten carbonate fuel cells operate at much higher temperatures, making the internal processing of hydrocarbon fuels possible, further simplifying the system and reducing costs. Because of the improved economics, solid oxide fuel cells are showing promise for applications such as industrial and electric generating stations. Already, two 25 kilowatt demonstration units are being tested in Japan, with one 20 kilowatt unit operating in Southern California. Solid oxide systems use a ceramic electrolyte, allowing temperatures to reach 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Power generating efficiencies up to 45% have been demonstrated, 
and overall system efficiency is much higher in applications which take advantage of the heat byproduct through cogeneration. Solid oxide fuel cells are configured in planar stacks or in monolithic or tubular structures. A typical tubular cell consists of five basic components, a porous ceramic support tube, a cathode, a solid electrolyte, an anode, and an electronically conducting interconnection. Air flows through the center of each tube while gaseous fuel bathes its exterior. In the monolithic solid oxide fuel cell, each electrode is comprised of a corrugated layer fused to two flat layers. A solid electrolyte is sandwiched between the two electrodes. As fuel and air flow through the corrugated channels, the electrochemical reaction releases electrons, starting the flow of current. Although more difficult to fabricate, the monolithic fuel cell configuration is projected to have a higher power density than either tubular or planar solid oxide fuel cells. The molten carbonate fuel cell is currently in the final stages of prototype testing for utility power generation. Like the solid oxide, the molten carbonate fuel cell also promises high fuel efficiencies and low emissions because of high operating temperatures of around 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. Because of their high temperatures, these fuel cells are also well suited for cogeneration applications. Both systems are ideal where electricity and heat are needed on a continuous basis. The molten carbonate electrolyte is made of a mixture of potassium and lithium carbonates, which when melted become ionically conductive. Similar to the solid oxide monolithic structure, the molten carbonate fuel cell has these corrugated flow channels for fuel and air. But here they're made of stainless steel, while the electrodes themselves are made of porous nickel and nickel oxide. Again, because of high temperatures, the molten carbonate and solid oxide fuel cells eliminate the need for higher cost platinum catalysts used in lower temperature fuel cells. These fuel cells are inherently simpler and potentially more cost effective. Another advantage is that carbon monoxide, considered a catalyst poison in other fuel cells, can be used directly in the cell, providing additional fuel and further simplifying the system. So, how good is this efficient and clean machine, the fuel cell? Whether for stationary operation or for transportation, the fuel cell far surpasses any other energy conversion device in its purity of operation. Compared with any current internal combustion engine, emissions with fuel cells using hydrocarbons are minute. And when the fuel cell is fueled with pure hydrogen, Pollutants are literally zero. And compared with existing turbines and other internal combustion engines, fuel cells generate electricity at far higher efficiencies. Fuel cells are here today, and more and more will become part of our everyday lives. Isn't it time we learned more about them?